trying to um, uh, engage with the uh, uh, European Affairs from all different uh, uh, viewpoints. And uh, today we are particularly uh, delighted to uh, team up with uh, uh, Britain for Europe, a, um, a new organization that uh, has uh, um, developed nationally, uh, seeking to um, continue or to stop Brexit, to continue uh, uh, British uh, membership of uh, uh, the, uh, the European Union. And uh, we are particularly uh, delighted to welcome uh, Richard Corbett to, uh, to, um, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, building, to this university. Richard is uh, one of the um, most respected uh, uh, commentators of European uh, affairs and uh, uh, a member of uh, uh, the European uh, Parliament since uh, 1996 with uh, a short uh, uh, interval between 2009 and 2014, during which time he remained perhaps even more influential uh, because he was a special advisor of the then president of uh, the uh, European Council, Herman Van Rompuy. Uh, uh, that gives you an indication of uh, uh, the esteem and the, uh, the knowledge that uh, uh, Richard possesses on this uh, matter. Uh, Richard is also, of course, the, uh, uh, the vice president of the European Movement. Uh, here in the uh, um, uh, in the UK and the the deputy uh, leader of uh, uh, the uh, the Labour uh, uh, parliamentary group in the European in the European Parliament. It's a position that uh, he has held uh, beforehand as well. Uh, again, uh, demonstrating that uh, um, when it comes to, uh, to the European Union, fewer people can speak with uh, uh, with greater authority. And uh, we are delighted that you uh, came. And thank you for uh, giving up your uh, your Saturday. Uh, afternoon as well. Uh, we have agreed with uh, with Richard that uh, uh, he will speak for uh, 20 minutes, half an hour, uh, uh, on uh, um, how we get to this point and uh, also what to do now. Uh, and uh, of course, in the second part of this uh, event, we are only uh, uh, encouraged uh, to, uh, to ask questions. Any questions you want. Uh, you don't need to be uh, um, uh, uh, expert. Uh, you are not here by virtue of your affiliation with the university, so you're here as active citizens, which in a way it's even more important to us. So any questions uh, that uh, uh, you want, any criticisms that uh, you might have about things, any frustrations that uh, uh, you want to vent, uh, uh, Richard is your, uh, is your man. He's not responsible for Brexit, but uh, I'm sure he has a lot of complaints in his uh, 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 travels. So. Uh, uh, Let's hope that the, uh, the, uh, the discussion that follows is active and uh, um, uh, um, useful for, for all of you. So, thanks again for coming, Richard, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you for those kind words of introduction. Can you hear me at the back? Because MEPs don't have such loud voices as MPs. <laughs> we, we don't need to bellow across a baying chamber. On the contrary, we have microphones because of the interpretation. So we, we tend not to have such um, powerful voices. But if you can hear me, that's all right then in the back. Um, two weeks ago, the negotiations for the divorce deal between Britain and the European Union started the first and so far only meeting. One remarkable fact at that meeting was that the British government handed over not a single position paper, not at the meeting, nor in advance of the meeting, as the European Union had done. And that's because on all the key issues to be faced, the British government still doesn't know exactly what it wants to ask for in these negotiations. And make no mistake, this is the mother of all divorce cases. There are over 7,000 subjects which at some point or another, assuming we go ahead with Brexit, would need to be settled and solved. They range from minor things to pretty important things to mega important things. Things. And people discover new things every day. To give an example of a minor one, pet passports. Yeah? To take your dog on holiday in the summer. Quarter of a million Brits do that every year. The EU has a scheme for pet passports. If your dog is, has the proper vaccinations, a 
chip, if we get some little passport, we can take it anywhere in the European Union. If we're leaving the European Union, unless we negotiate to stay in that scheme, overnight you won't be able to take your dock on that day anymore. It's a minor thing, but of course if, if you need a guide dog, it's more important. <laughs> If you're a farmer whose farm straddles the Irish border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, then your sheepdog will no longer legally be able to go from one end of the farm to the other. These examples of minor little things are numerous, and they add up. Medium-sized things. Let's take something that's not been talked about very much, the, the various technical agencies that the European Union has, where, as European countries, we, we pool resources to, to share the, the task. Take the European Air Safety Agency. Through that, we pool the testing and certifying of all aircraft in Europe, instead of us all duplicating each other. Now, in the current state of the law, to fly anywhere in Europe, you need a certificate from that agency. Without it, you cannot fly. You can't even fly across the Atlantic either because of the EU-USA Open Skies Agreement. Covers that. <coughs> now, if we leave without addressing that problem, then overnight, no British aircraft can fly anywhere in Europe or across the Atlantic. You can still do internal flights within the UK, but not anywhere else. So obviously that is an issue that has to be addressed. What do you do about it? <coughs> is Britain going to set up its own agency, duplicating the work of the European agency, recruiting the necessary expertise at relatively short notice, all this at great cost, and then <coughs> negotiate for recognition of that agency, not just with the EU but with airline authorities across the world, so yes, we recognise your certifications. Or does Britain say, hmm, that's a bit silly and costly. Perhaps we could say to the EU, sorry we're leaving, but could we stay in this agency after all, please? We still don't know what the government's intention is. A year after the referendum, <coughs> as regards this agency. And that's, the, that's just one of many agencies. What about the medicines agency? Pretty vital for our pharmaceutical industry because it authorizes the placing on the European market of all new um, <coughs> pharmaceutical products. What about the chemicals agency? Ditto for the chemicals industry in Britain. And you can go through these agency after agency. <coughs> Different type of agency. Europol, which organizes the cooperation of police forces across Europe. There are 40,000 cross-border police investigations every year coordinated through Europe. If we tear ourselves out of that, how do you deal with cross-border crime, international criminal gangs, drug traffickers, and, need we remind ourselves in this city, terrorism? This is a vital tool. Yet we still don't know. There have been hints that we'd like to stay in Europe, oh please. There are indeed countries that are not members of the European Union who have observer status in Europol, not full member, <coughs> so you don't have such a role in the decision taking. But of course that involves accepting that if there's any dispute about the rules, it's the European Court of Justice that settles that dispute, which this government, at least under Theresa May, has ruled out. Those are the medium-sized things. And then the big ones, which have been in the news this week, again, the single market and the customs union. The customs union, there's no tariff barriers within the European Union, and we have a common external tariff vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world. If we leave the customs union, even if we manage to negotiate zero tariff access, which is a big if, to the European Union for all our products. The very fact of exporting into a customs union, any customs union, from outside means that there has to be, under WTO rules, etc., a verification of the origin of your products so that it's not, say, Japan exporting via Britain to get duty free access to the single market, to the EU customs union. 
What does that mean? It means both a lot of red tape, extra form filling for firms, and checks at the border. You can diminish one by having more of the other, but there'll always be a little bit of both. That's a huge burden for firms, especially those whose production chains cross the border, sometimes several times, as in our air manufacturing sector or in our automobile sector. I met with Honda UK the other day. They have over 100 lorries a day bringing parts from Dover to their plant in Swindon. They have warehousing, so they have a stock in case there's any holdups. That stock lasts for one hour's worth of production. Any holdup beyond that, they have to halt production. And they've got just in time delivery from parts coming from Europe. So any holdups at Dover, and some people have estimated that's going the other way, of course, but Operation Stack, which you see from time to time on the M20 when there's a holdup on the channel, that will become almost a permanent feature. Unless we stay in the customs union. In which case, why is there a man called Liam Fox in the Department for International Trade? Because that only makes sense if you're leaving the customs union and you're going to make separate trade deals across the world. We still don't know how this is going to be resolved. Similar arguments about the single market. That's within the custom view, but having also a common set of rules. That's what a common market, this common market, has achieved. We have common rules on consumer protection, competition policy for fair competition, environmental standards, workplace rights, technical standards. That's what European legislation, or this so-called red tape from Brussels, is largely about. It's having common rules for the common market rather than 28 different rules. So if we leave the single market, we have the freedom to make our own rules. Wonderful. But then, if we diverge, we have a barrier to trade vis-à-vis -vis our main export market. If you want to stay in the single market, you avoid that problem but you have to follow the rules. And then, if we leave, we have no say on those rules. But frankly, the leaving the European Union causes the political damage of no longer having a say. Do we want to compound that with the economic damage that leaving a single market would entail? That is a very lively debate, as you've seen this week in the House of Commons, within political parties, not just between them. Um, that too, I still think when I hear some people in Westminster talking about this whole thing, they still don't appreciate the magnitude of what is at stake. It's as if we were leaving UNESCO. Oh, good organization, does, does some useful work. Pity we're leaving, really, but hey, you know, there's other problems to deal with. <coughs> no, this is a much, much bigger issue than many people seem to realize. And that's where, as the negotiations now really start in earnest, one presumes, many of these problems will become much more visible. There will be growing awareness of that. And that's where there may be a chance of revisiting the issue of Brexit. Very few people voted for Brexit at any cost. Most of them voted for Brexit at no cost because they were told it's going to save loads of money. We'll all go to the NHS. <laughs> As it becomes clearer that Brexit is actually a rather costly, damaging exercise, damaging for our economy, I'm not referring to the divorce cost, I'm referring to the economic cost, those people are entitled to say, hang on a minute, that's not what I was told, that's not what I voted for. I want a chance to reconsider. And I'm convinced that very few Leave voters really voted to put up barriers to trade for our manufacturers vis-à-vis -vis our main export market, wanted to pull our financial sector out of having the right to passport insurance and banking services across Europe, wanted to tear our farmers out of a common agricultural system where with agreed levels of subsidy you can, you're allowed to compete and sell your products <coughs> across Europe. A few of them wanted to pull our universities out of European research cooperation 
and funding, and so on and so forth. And these are, I think, the issues that we need to seize on to make people aware how it affects them, the damage that would happen in the sectors that they work in or that are important for their city, their town, their county, their area. And by making awareness of that grow and political pressure grow on that, that's where there may be a chance just to pull back from the brink. In the debate in the House of Lords on triggering Article 50, I think Lord Kerr summed it up very well when he said, over the next two years, in these negotiations, we are going to test to destruction the theory that you can have your cake and eat it. When we find out that you can't, we have a decision to take. And Britain can indeed change its mind. I know the government said, no, once you've triggered Article 50, that's it. And we're on an automatic conveyor belt to Brexit, whatever happens. That's not the prevailing view. Uh, Donald Tusk, uh, the German government, the French government, uh, the European Parliament in a resolution, the Committee of Regents have all said, of course, Britain can change its mind, and that would be welcome. But they can't do it for us. That battle has to be fought here. So I'm delighted that, uh, that um, you've come here today. I'm delighted overall that your organization has, has um, established itself and has so many enthusiastic members. I'm delighted that you're converging with the European movement and others um, to make a, a common effort, uh, perhaps even a common, uh, I'm not quite sure where we are on you becoming a sec sections or local sections of the European movement. Whatever it is, the technical detail doesn't matter. The key thing is that we're working together in this common cause. There will be others, but let's make no mistake, it's going to be tough. Um, the center of gravity in political parties has shifted because of the result of the referendum. To shift it back again is not going to be easy. Uh, but there are people in all parties, some more than others, who are willing to take this step. And I think a crucial point will be, if we get to that point, that when this so-called divorce deal under Article 50 comes back, for a so-called meaningful vote in the House of Commons. But if the Commons rejects it and says no, what does that mean? It can't mean leaving without a deal, because everybody agrees that's a disaster. Now everyone agrees that's a disaster. They didn't two months ago. It could mean go away and negotiate further, but the scope of changing much at that point will be very limited. So what it must mean is We've looked over the precipice and we've decided, no, this is a step too far to take as a country. Now that we see what Brexit really entails, we need a chance to change our mind. Legally, Parliament can stop it. Politically, I expect it will need, at some point, another referendum. Because otherwise, for years and years ahead, you would have the narrative, ah, the people voted to leave and the politicians stopped it. So we'd have to go back at some point. And that referendum won't be easy either. But the key thing at the moment is to build up the political resistance to it, to say, look, this Brexit is much more than, entails much more than we were ever told. It's a disaster. It's going to be costly, damaging to our economy, damaging to our culture, damaging to our country generally. We shouldn't go ahead with it. And that's got to be our task over the next 18 months or more. Thank you very much. I told you it would be good. <laughs> and uh, uh, very much to, uh, to the point and concise. I think that uh, um, I, I expect that people will have lots of uh, questions on the, uh, the cost and on the on the way forward and so on. Uh, I suggest that uh, uh, we take them in group of uh,
two, perhaps, to start off with, and then uh, make sure that everybody gets a chance to, to ask a question, and then uh, uh, ask Richard to, uh, to respond. I have a few questions, but I'm not going to ask any for now, uh, because I want to give you the chance to, uh, to, uh, to start first. So, uh, first question on the back. Um, can I ask you whether you voted for this amendment that just been put down, John amendment? No, I'm not an MP, I'm, I'm an MEP. Yes, I'm yeah. Is there another question perhaps on the Labour Party so we can uh, group them together because, yes, please. I, I'm a hard Remainer. I've been a pro-European since the 60s, uh, before we joined, and I'm still just about a member of the Labour Party, but I'm really struggling. And there doesn't seem to be anywhere to go. Um, I wonder if I should stay and keep arguing to leadership that doesn't just I'm not worried about leftist views, I've been probably voting green if I had a chance, but <laughs> you get that general gist. Um, there doesn't seem to be a focus for what well, I think the opposition to the, mo to, to the most catastrophic event in, in British history in, in, since the war. And um, I feel lost, I can scatter my interest in a dozen different pro-EU or partial pro-EU movements and I don't know where the new coalescent, coalescent coalition is going to be. Coalescence, I should say, of forces is going to be, or if there's ever going to be one. You, you might know better than you. Yeah, well, I cannot honestly say that I'm happy about the state of things in the Labour Party when it comes to the European Union. Um, this is a battle that has to be fought within parties, all parties, um, some more than others. Um, rather than between parties. Um, in the long run, ideally, we would need a, a Britain which is like most other countries in Europe, where the mainstream centre-right and centre-left parties are both pro-European. That would be ideal, but we're a long way from that. And in the Labour Party, it's no secret that Jeremy Corbyn is uh, somewhat, uh, was somewhat lukewarm in the was campaigning in the referendum. He did campaign for Remain. He did, I, I dug out a quote of his the other day, which was very good, and I um, keep on reminding people of what he said then. But um, he and others take the view, either the people have spoken, we must respect it, even though it was an advisory referendum won by a narrow majority on the basis of a pack of lies and with a questionable franchise. <laughs> <laughs> or there are others who take the view more tactically, they're worried about Labour hemorrhaging votes to the Conservatives or UKIP on this issue, especially in the North. Um, or I suspect in one or two cases they never really were pro-European. So there's a mixture. But the bulk of certainly Labour Party members, and I think the bulk of Labour MPs, are not happy with that line. Um, you saw Trucker's, Truck O'Neill's amendment had quite a lot of support, despite the fact that there were misgivings about the tactics of that. Because remember Labour's official amendment said we should aim to retain all the benefits we have now from the single market or the customs union. Well, you can't retain all those benefits without staying in them. <laughs> so I think it would have been more sensible to interpret Labour's position to mean that and put pressure, oh, that's what we've said, of course it must mean that, rather than a separate wording and then dividing the party in a way that didn't, didn't take enough people along with it. But, you know, that's Westminster tactics. I don't, I'm not a specialist on that. I'm not a member of the House of Commons. They get up to their little games. Um, and um, in the end, I'm not, I'm not sure that his amendment helped terribly much, terribly much. But it did show that there are quite a few people willing to take a stand, even when the whips say, no, no, you shouldn't vote that way. 
we must build on. Uh, are there more questions on, on the Labour Party? I mean, if, if, if there are more, we can, we can take them. If, no? Yes, please. Sorry, just, just uh, what is your take on this business about we want to stay in this and we want to stay in that? Surely they actually understand that they can't have their cake and eat it because it's not really much different from the Tory stance other than they, they will stay in their European culture of justice, wouldn't they? I think that was yeah. the and they want to stay in the customs union, but... I'm not sure they want to stay. I think the Labour doesn't want to stay in the customs union. Let's take a couple more questions, perhaps, and then... Uh, yes, please. Hello there. You talked before, Richard, about the uh, medium-sized problems associated with Brexit, about the things like the aid multi country agencies and things like that. And you spelled that quite well right there, problem for multiple sections of the economy and things like that. So I wanted to ask why you think that whilst the European Union Parliament and things like that seem to have a much better grasp of the actual issues, whereas the UK Parliament, in, in the media at least, don't seem to um, have spent much time addressing these issues uh, for the public. Yeah. Well, first of all, on the, the, the Labour's position, um, compared to the government's position, the, the government up to now has said Half Brexit, by which I mean leaving the customs union and the single, uh, the single market, and indeed, as far as one can puzzle it out, most of the technical agencies. Whereas Labour has said we'd like to stay in the agencies, more or less said we'd like to stay in the customs union, but has had this, this I was, you could honestly say weasel words about the single market, it's not clear, but with some of them saying no, we can't accept the single market because we would then be a rule taker. Um, and, have, um, and have to follow the rules not having a say on them anymore. Um, but the price of that, of leaving the single market, as I said earlier, you're compounding that political damage with economic damage. So there's still a lively debate on that. The next stage, I think, is if, if you get in either party, because the government's divided, let's not forget, and is rethinking its position after the general election, if they come round to the view that, ah, yes, we should stay in the customs union in the single market, then the next stage of the argument is to say, fine, that's the sensible thing to do economically. But surely, politically, if we're staying in the single market, we want to have a say on it. We want to have our seat at the table. And that gently brings you back to the argument to stay in completely. But that's, in some, for some segments in each party, We've got to first win them over to staying in the single market in the customs union. And the next stage is going to say, well, if, if, you, don't, if you accept that, which you're right, because it makes sense, and we folly not to, then the logical next step is to say, well, actually, we need to have a say. So stay in. The other question was asked on agencies, sorry, in the House of Commons. Um, the, the House of Commons did set up this, uh, and I presume this will be set up again in the new parliament, this committee on Brexit that was chaired by Hilary Benn. Um, and that was taking evidence and giving some publicity and beginning to get to grips with some of, the, some of these issues. Um, of course, the common system as a committee like that, it only involves, what is it, 25 members out of 600 and something, but it was a start. But um, if it starts again in the new parliament, we'll see who the chair is. Um, that is a, is a vehicle that can also be used to spread awareness of these difficulties and, and what is really at stake. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yes, a question about free movement, uh, Richard, which I think is a very close issue to the Labour Party. Uh, I, I just wondered the extent to which there's an opportunity to sort of detoxify this whole thing and learn from the Swiss um, referendum and how they managed to work their way through that, as I understand it, and, and introduce some idea of local preference, mm -hmm. in, as opposed to ending free movement. What are the possibilities of, of using more, focus more on employment legislation and job training and those sorts of things to improve employment, as opposed to um, ending the free movement, which is so controversial, obviously relates so much to membership of the single market. Mm -hmm. Let's get another uh, uh, question. Um, is in Utah, right? yeah. Yeah. One thing that uh, we need to consider is also when we talk about economy, the economy is based on export and import. 
And uh, if uh, you go some grasping economics, you know that import uh, is more important than exports. So, uh, the UK exports 80% of their staff to the EU of items, goods, uh, uh, services. Uh, now, what the levers are saying is that they can transfer 80% from EU into the rest of the world. The will increase the global market. The question is that it's not that easy. If you go 100 million pounds, the EU export to the EU, this will not transfer in 100 million pounds and we will uh, um, deal with the trade deal with the rest of the world because uh, you have to change some of your items, you have to ch change the mechanic of the items that you export, for example, if you export transfer, uh, you get trade deals with China, uh, the items have to be slightly different. People have to learn languages, they have to learn new skills. So it's not a question of transferring a, a piece of banana from this place to another place. Question How do you expect, in your point of view, that the UK will be able to transfer the market, as Leon Fox is saying, and for me, as well as handling the, the sound? How do you think it is easy for the UK to transfer the market, the import exports that they, we got at the moment with the rest of Europe on a worldwide, for example, with the Brits? When we know that, for example, China has spent more than seven years to start the deal with Switzerland, and the deal is based on the size of the economies of the two countries, reason, and we know that, that China has uh, the well, the, the, the outcome of the, this trade deal is the fact that China will uh, export their own goods for 10 years into Switzerland without Switzerland could do nothing, basically they are going to for 10 years until they will be able to yeah. uh, reciprocate. And I think it, this one is a good example, not that Switzerland is not the same size as the UK, but it gives a good example because China based uh, its current trades on uh, small economies that can give access to larger markets. And if the UK is not good enough to give access to larger markets, then we've got to Let's uh, let Richard answer. Oh, that was okay. <coughs> on the, the first one, freedom, freedom of movement. Um, frankly, the, the rest of the European Union doesn't quite get why we have such a problem. It was, as you know, one of the key issues in the referendum campaign, and it was handled, I think, very badly by the Remain side in terms of rebutting it. But in terms of doing something about it, I think there's, there are three things that can be done without tearing up the principle of freedom of movement. First, let's not forget that most migrants in Britain have come from outside the European Union. Nothing to do with EU rules whatsoever. It's entirely national rules that the government. And indeed, when the, the, by the way, when the Conservatives came to power in 2010 promising to reduce net migration to Britain radically, they failed to do anything about that, that half that they controlled entirely. Now, there may have been good reasons for it, but that, given their rhetoric, we're going to cut it, and it didn't get cut at all, it became very convenient for them to suddenly start saying, oh, we can't do anything about it because of EU freedom of movement. <laughs> ha! No, it was... The bulk of migration is entirely under Britain's rules anyway. It's up to us whether we want to be open, closed, how much, how restricted, how open, how restricted. Second, freedom of movement is not an unconditional right. EU legislation. You can move to another EU country as a citizen, but you either have to be working or have a realistic chance of getting a job within a short period of time, or be self-sufficient and not a burden on that state that you've moved to. Now, countries like Belgium and France ask two or three thousand people a year to return to their Home country, not least to leave Belgium or France, because they don't meet those conditions. Britain never did really, it just blamed the system. Now, 
I know that's partly because we don't have a system of official addresses and identity cards, so it's hard to find people once they're in. But the rest of Europe is all, you know, that's, that's not our fault. <laughs> that's, your, that's your fault. It's up to you to find ways of dealing with this. And the third thing that can be done is to take measures nationally to attenuate the effects of high levels of migration in particular areas especially or in particular sectors. There's nothing in EU law that would prohibit Britain, for instance, making it illegal for companies to advertise job vacancies abroad without advertising them locally, like a certain very large um, clothes company warehouse in Yorkshire that I know does it advertises it's near Doncaster, it only advertises in Poland when it has vacancies. No. You could make that illegal. It would require people to proper enforcement of the minimum wage and of going rates. Um, reintroducing the fund that Labour had when it was in power to help local authorities that are under extra pressure, whose infrastructure is under extra pressure because of higher numbers than usual. After all, the Treasury makes a profit on EU migrants in Britain, they pay one third more in tax than they take in services and benefits added together. Yeah? Why doesn't the Treasury redistribute a little bit of that profit to those local authorities that are bearing the costs, extra costs in some places? There's a whole host of things that could be done under domestic legislation. And that three-pronged approach would enable you to address public concerns, which are real, about, as we all know from knocking on doors, don't we, about immigration, without tearing up the principle of free movement. I think it can be done. Now, the question on trade with the rest of the world is a very important one. And this Fox's idea that we'll have wonderful new trade deals. I call it the Fox paradox, you know, the, the idea that you by, by tearing yourself out of your main <coughs> export market, half of your exports, in the hope that you'll somehow compensate by getting wonderful deals elsewhere in the world, um, not so easy. Partly for the reasons you rightly drew attention to. But partly as well, because if we leave the customs union, the first thing we have to do is negotiate new arrangements, deals with the rest of the world, 160 odd members of the WTO to set tariff levels. We might go in and say, we'll set the same tariffs as we now have via the EU. No problem. Ha, huh. no problem. It has to be accepted by each of those countries. Some of them will certainly uh, say, no, we're not happy with, with that. We, we, we agreed that with the EU, because it's the world's largest market. You as Britain, what's in it for us? Take, the, take South Korea as another example. The EU-South Korea trade deal came into force I think, about five years ago. Britain has doubled its exports to South Korea since then. Why? Because we gained access, easier access to the Korean market in exchange for them getting access to the European market as a whole. In fact, most of their exports go to Germany given what they manufacture. So if we come along as Britain and say, could we have the same deal please? They'll say, hmm, what's in it for us? There may be countries that would be very happy with the same deal, but they've, had, they've got some other bee in their bonnet. Maybe, maybe, Argentina will say, yeah, sure, no problem, as soon as you start negotiations with us on the Falkland Islands. We don't know. We're putting ourselves in a position of being held hostage in this way. And those who who make great claims that free from the shackles of the EU, we can make trade agreements much more easily. <coughs> Switzerland is often quoted by Dan Hammond, the conservative Eurosceptic campaign, and says, look, Switzerland has a free trade deal with China, isn't it wonderful? As you've said, it's, it's very asymmetrical. The Swiss can't even sell their watches to China yeah, at the moment. So clout matters in international trade negotiations. We've got trade free trade or more or less free trade deals with 50 odd countries across the world via the EU, negotiating with the clout and leverage of the world's largest market. Coming along just as Britain, we're not going to get those same deals. And we'll have to make all kinds of concessions, um, 
and with, with the USA and all the old nightmares of what TTIP might involve, if we're just coming along as Britain, especially with this government, we'll accept everything, you know, chlorinated chicken and hormones and beef and all the rest of it, because we'll have no choice, because we'll be desperate for a deal. So the idea that, ah, we will compensate for what we lose with Europe by having wonderful deals with the rest of the world, I think is nonsense. Right. Um. It's not technically a much need for a very eloquent presentation. Probably the vast majority of everybody in this room here, myself, myself and Rudy, would agree to your analysis. And speaking of myself personally, I think you persuaded me to reapply to join the European movement because the initial response to the referendum I thought was a bit feeble. I'm pleased that I'm more active now. My question is this. If we do, uh, as most of us here, fight and campaign against this, we need to know our enemy, put it bluntly, and what motivates them. And I see three, if you like, categories, domains, which you've already alluded to. There are people there who vote and leave largely because of xenophobia, not wanting to join a foreigner, not wanting Britain to be great again. There's the sort of economic cake and eat it people who think that all the standards will be the same. And then there's the third category, which I think is the most sinister, uh, which if you blew Tory would lead you to uh, a, a sort of uh, paradise uh, of um, tax um, evasion by big corporations and if you read it would mean you could do whatever you wanted to do uh, in terms of state control, state subsidy and so on. Now in your judgment these three possible reasons to both leave and at the moment three possible philosophies behind our um, enemies to put it bluntly. Which ones should we fear most? Is it all three and do you have any tips as to how we sort of defeat them? Mm. Let's try and keep questions short so that we can. Uh, we'll take them in group of four now because I think they're quite uh, they're quite a few. So uh, related question. Uh, this is a question for you as a politician. So my reading of opinion polling is that there isn't a great deal of shift from people who voted Leave towards Remain, and there does seem to be quite a lot of acceptance by some people who voted Remain for the decision that's been made. So we have an uphill struggle for a second. We also have a large uh, part of the Leave demographic, which is retired or is not in work, is not directly linked to the real economy, and maybe gets more of its information about the economy from reading newspapers than it does from actually being in work. So how does it work? Um, and there are poor people whose who, who's, uh, uh, engagement with the economy uh, is on the horizon next Tuesday. So given that the polling evidence doesn't show a strong shift towards Remain, 48% would be a fine thing now. As a politician, how do you see us swinging back to 48% beyond in the next 12 to 18 months? Over there at the back. You want to do Um, I, my question really follows on from the, the previous speaker. What you've illustrated, I think, only too well is the sheer complexity, the sheer size of what we're confronted with. And the man in the street, knowing pretty well zero about the whole thing. Um, if we're going to change opinion, surely there needs to be some kind of education exercise. And could you possibly see that happening? Would it be a party political thing? Would it be the government thing would be something else, but how do we begin to communicate some of the really absolutely critical issues that we mentioned here today to the ordinary people out there? I'll just uh, um, st step in for one minute and uh, please excuse uh, the abuse of uh, uh, the chairmanship here. Uh, when Will uh, Straw came uh, here um, 18 months ago, mm -hmm. I remember people telling him and I, I think I was one of them, that don't focus the argument so much on the economic damage. We all recognize it, uh, um, uh, and uh, the more expertly you look into this, the more clear it becomes. But that's something that uh, can be very easily counter-attacked by um, uh, uh, arguments of the type of the 300 million uh, pounds uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the NHS and so on. The question is, do you think that the idea, the argument that Britain 
has been, always has been, culturally, politically, economically, even in terms of identity, part of Europe. This argument is never heard. Mm -hmm. huh? We never hear that uh, all Europeans go to the theater and, and, and watch Shakespeare, right? We, we, we never talk about uh, the, uh, the cultural proximity between the two sides, which really uh, should never kind of uh, accept that Britain is some kind of an island that is out there. That kind of political, ideational argument is never made. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, for those of you who were not there in that debate, the, the argument that uh, Will Straw made is that, oh, we don't want to patronize people. We accept they're anti-European at heart, and we're going <laughs> to sort of uh, uh, project the economic fear argument, because that will register better. Because if we tell them that they're a little bit xenophobic, they're a little bit uh, 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 sort of uh, too negative against Europe, mm -hmm. then we risk the Gordon Brown uh, uh, kind of incident when she, uh, he called uh, that woman a bigot, mm -hmm. uh, bigot gate. And I, I remember Will saying, we don't want to be doing the same here because that would produce uh, the very opposite effect of what we're trying to achieve. So, in short, is the, the political, cultural, ideational argument lost even for the next referendum? <laughs> <laughs> They're not yes, no answers. <laughs> First, the question of, uh, of our enemies. I, I, I think there's a, there's a lot in that. You, you, you've had three. I, I often say there's, there's been two driving forces, but they're, they're more or less the same as you identified as the <coughs> driving force on the anti-European side that is nationalistic, <coughs> xenophobic, the ultra-nationalists, as, as it were, about identity and so on, which include racists as well. It's wrong to say all Leave voters are racists, but all racists voted Leave. <laughs> <laughs> And the other is what I call the, the neoliberal right in economic terms. It's no coincidence in my, my mind being a bit political here that the, it's all political, isn't it? <laughs> that some of the strongest opponents of the European Union are on the neoliberal right wing because what they dislike about the European Union is that this market, the EU single market, the biggest market in the world, is a market with rules. Rules to protect consumers, rules to protect workers, rules to protect the environment rules to regulate competition to make it fair. As we've seen with the Commission this last week taking on one of the might of Google. Now, none of our countries alone would stand up to, a, to, to these big multinational giants, but together, Europe has mechanisms allowing us to do that. They hate that. They want an absolute free for all. And of course, some of their money comes from the, the interests of those who who don't want a strong European Union in that sense. So, so I, I, I agree with you on, on that. How to shift the opinion <coughs> pulse? Now, actually, when you think about it, you would have expected a big shift to supporting leave. Those people who weren't quite sure, on balance, voted to remain, who say, well, okay, I vote to remain, but it's settled now, we've had a referendum, and there are plenty of people who say that, you'd have expected a shift to the Leave side. But the fact that the opinion polls still show more or less the same division means that there must already have been an equivalent number who've moved the other way, already. In fact, some opinion polls recently show that were even more encouraging, but, but one would have expected public opinion to rally behind the result of the referendum. It hasn't. So I think that actually is, is encouraging as a start there. Um, I think the, one of the questions mentioned the demographics. We all know the, the fact that older people tended to vote to leave and younger people tended to vote to remain. And somebody I know quipped the other day that... Uh,